Major depressive disorder, or more commonly known simply as depression, is a crippling mental disorder affecting hundreds of millions of people and their surroundings. Given the diversity of symptoms of depression, it is incredibly difficult to treat, which is why there is always a desire to find new and improved methods. One method that has received FDA approval for the first time in 2008 is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. In this video, we will first cover the basic principles of TMS, then we will discuss the study by O'Riordan and colleagues from 2007, which was the catalyst for FDA approval of the Neurostar TMS device for treatment of major depressive disorder. Note that this study was performed 14 years ago and TMS therapy has improved considerably since then. Therefore, at the end we will briefly discuss how TMS treatment developed in the years after. But we will go into more detail about other FDA approved TMS treatments in future videos. Importantly, if you feel troubled about your mental health status, we encourage you to seek contact with a mental health specialist. This video is meant to inform you about how TMS works and how it is used to treat depression. As such, this video does not intend to persuade you in favor of TMS or to oppose TMS as a treatment method. TMS, originally invented in 1985, uses a brief magnetic field to induce action potentials in the neurons of the brain. Traditionally, a lot of research has been performed on the motor cortex of the brain. The motor cortex connects to muscles of the body, and this gives a relative direct outcome measure. A single pulse of TMS over the motor cortex will induce a movement in an arm or a leg. This can be observed in all people who do not have any clear lesions of the motor cortex or the spinal tract. Although a single activation is fascinating, this effect is short-lived, in the range of milliseconds. Therefore, the question arises whether TMS can be used to induce longer-lasting effects. Research studies of the last 25 years have therefore investigated so-called repetitive TMS where pulses are applied for up to 40 minutes. Indeed, over the last two and a half decades, evidence has been accumulated that a single repetitive TMS session can have after effects of about 60 to 90 minutes. A high frequency pattern with very fast pulses typically increases brain activity, whereas a low frequency pattern with a pulse each second typically decreases brain activity. The crucial word here is typically, because these effects of repetitive TMS differ between people. Whereas these effects can be observed in a decent amount of people, some people do not respond at all, and others show even the opposite effect. Various studies have investigated the variability of repetitive TMS, and the expected pattern related to high and low frequency stimulation is observed in about 60% of people. So now we were talking about a single repetitive TMS session. To investigate longer lasting effects of repetitive TMS that last for weeks or months, studies have applied stimulation over periods of several weeks. Evidence for such long lasting effects comes mostly from research on neurological disorders such as stroke or psychiatric disorders such as depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. Let's talk about safety. Magnetic fields that are produced by TMS, but also for example by MRI scanners, do not cause damage to the brain tissue. Therefore, TMS is classified as a non-invasive method and is thus generally safe. However, some side effects can occur. Repeated clicking sounds can cause buzzing in the ears, and repeated tapping on the head can induce headaches. Also, the weight of the TMS coil on the head 
can induce soreness in the neck muscles. Additionally, a complete TMS session can induce fatigue. These side effects are typically mild and disappear relatively quickly. However, it should also be pointed out that the intensities used during TMS therapy are typically relatively high, which increases the likelihood of such side effects. It should also be mentioned that in very rare cases TMS can induce a seizure, although the risk of this is very small in people who have no prior history of epilepsy. Finally, one point needs to be addressed that is particularly crucial for a therapeutic use of TMS. As mentioned before, TMS effects can be variable, and in some cases the TMS effect is opposite to the intended effect. This means that the symptoms of a disorder may get worse. This is not really a side effect, but rather a failure of the treatment, but it should be kept in mind when considering TMS therapy. Now let's discuss the paper by O'Riordan and colleagues from 2007. This research paper describes a multi-center randomized control trial. The study was conducted in locations across the United States, Canada and Australia. The total sample consisted of 301 patients with major depressive disorder. Of these patients, 155 received active TMS therapy whereas 146 received a placebo TMS, a so-called sham TMS. It should be pointed out that compared to other studies, this is a very large sample size. Importantly, all patients were treatment resistant, meaning that they had at least one prior antidepressant therapy that had failed. Also, none of the patients was currently using antidepressant medication. TMS was applied for up to 6 weeks, with 5 sessions every week, meaning that there was a maximum total of 30 sessions. For the active stimulation group, each session consisted of a high-frequency repetitive TMS design. This implies that the patient received 4 seconds of stimulation with 10 pulses per second. After this, there was a 26 second rest period. In other words, each half minute there was a train of 40 pulses. This was repeated 75 times, resulting in a total time of 37 and a half minutes and 3000 total pulses per session. The placebo treatment looked exactly the same, except that no real stimulation was given. For this, researchers used a so-called sham coil, which looks and sounds the same from the outside but has a magnetic shield that prevents actual stimulation. The target location for stimulation was the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The goal of the high-frequency TMS paradigm was to increase activation of this left prefrontal area. This site was chosen based on previous studies that suggested that there is a potential imbalance between left and right prefrontal cortex in patients suffering from depression. It was suggested that left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity is decreased, whereas right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity is increased, compared to healthy controls. So how was depression measured? O'Riordan and colleagues investigated depression symptoms by looking at the scores of the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale and the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale. Scores on these questionnaires after the treatment were compared to baseline scores before the treatment. Main outcome measures were response rate and remission rates based on these questionnaires. Response rate was defined as a reduction of symptoms on the questionnaire compared to baseline of at least 50%. Remission rates related to a total score on the questionnaire below a certain value at which a patient no longer is identified as clinically depressed. So let's take a look at the results. After 6 weeks, response rates were around 24% across the different questionnaires for patients who received the actual TMS. The placebo group response rates were on average around 14%. Remission rates were around 15% for actual TMS and around 7% for the placebo treatment. Only two patients in the actual TMS group, which is 1.2%, 
reported significant worsening of the symptoms. Other side effects were reported too. Most commonly, pain on the head where the actual stimulation took place in about 35% of patients, followed by muscle twitches reported by 20% of patients. The severity of side effects was generally described as mild to moderate. Discontinuation due to the side effects was at 4.5%. So what can we conclude from these results? The conclusion of this study is that one out of four patients significantly benefited from repetitive TMS and this was significantly more than in the placebo condition. Approximately one out of seven patients improved in such a way that they were in remission. The response and remission rates found in this study are lower than those we would see from drug treatments for depression, such as SSRI, which have response rates of 50 to 60% and remission rates of 35 to 45%. However, when interpreting the response and remission rates of TMS in this study, a few important things need to be addressed. First of all, the study consisted of treatment-resistant patients. This implies that previous treatment, often a drug treatment, failed. As such, the TMS is a valuable second option for patients who do not respond to a drug treatment. Second of all, side effects are fairly mild and temporary. There is no risk of drug dependencies or other drug-related long-term side effects. This means that TMS constitutes a very low-risk alternative. Third, and most importantly, the here described study was performed in 2007 and FDA approval was obtained in 2008. In the 14 years since then, TMS therapy has improved significantly. A randomized control trial published by Lefkowitz and colleagues in 2015 reported a response rate of 38% using so-called deep TMS. Another randomized control trial three years later from 2018 published by Blumberg et al. reported a response rate of approximately 48%. Both of these studies led to FDA-approved TMS protocols respectively, and we will cover both of these studies in full detail in future videos. Several things have changed since 2008, which improved our understanding of depression as a disorder, the functioning of the brain, and the mechanisms of TMS. Since the beginning of TMS, new protocols with different stimulation parameters have been explored. For example, different prefrontal brain regions have been investigated. Also, the effects of duration, intensity and frequency of TMS have been studied. An example of a different protocol is theta burst stimulation, which differs from the original high and low frequency TMS paradigms and has shown promising results. On top of that, different manufacturers have employed different TMS machinery and coils to target deeper brain regions or stimulate more focally. Another improvement is the development of neuronavigation. By using MRI scans of a patient, neuronavigation can precisely pinpoint different brain regions for each individual. This means that the location of stimulation can be adjusted per participant. Being more precise in your stimulation target reduces variability, which eventually leads to higher response rates. Finally, after 2010, computational modeling was introduced, which allows for simulating TMS effects on each individual brain. The TMS-induced strength and extent of an electric field can be calculated. This further allows for personalizing TMS treatments, which improves the possibility of positive outcomes. And these are just a few examples of improvements of the last one and a half decades. Unfortunately, we haven't reached the finish line and a lot more research is needed. Nevertheless, in future videos, we will cover other FDA approved protocols in more detail and how the field has improved and is still improving. That's it for now. We hope you enjoyed our explanation. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments and we hope to see you the next time.